Okay. Are we ready to start? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, welcome to the Zoom audience and those in attendance. I really appreciate History House appreciates your attendance. I'm Patricia Harine. I'm the president of the History House. And I wanted to sort of start out with how this idea of a lecture series got started in the first place. I was reading Louis, Helen Louise Coburn's 1941 Skowhegan on the Kennebec um, history. And she noted that long before the eyes of any white man had rested upon Skowhegan Falls in the Kennebec, this place was familiar to the Abenaki Indians. Their canoes ran between shores that are part of our town and their feet trod the trail across this island, Skowhegan Island. They speared for salmon at the falls and raised corn in the intervals. So she was very aware that there was a history much before History House became a History House. And you know the, uh, the uh, people who came in after, the, uh, I, don't, I don't wanna get political, but I won't go there. Um, so this is part of our History House, our, I'm sorry, part of our town's history. And it had not been addressed at all by our History House. Um, and our board of trustees, uh, we really need to do this. We need to tell the full story of who lived here for at least 13,000 years before it was industrialized and developed and became a very different place. So the board of trustees um, said now is the time to do it and that's what we decided to do. Our goal for the lecture series was to offer our community members an opportunity to gain a wider understanding of the first residents and their descendants through the voices of current day Wabanaki people. And then our thank yous, uh, certainly this lecture series is made possible by a Davis Family Foundation. Um, we thank Jeremy Laham for all of his technical skills and his printing of posters and all the other things they do that are behind the scene you don't see, but we, Susan and I really appreciate. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we want to thank uh, Erin Scaly, Scaly, because she's the gal that's done all the graphic designs of the posters that we put around, and plus all the volunteers that have posted those posters. Um, John Harlow may show up to film it, and you know he's, generally speaking, been here for every one of these. So Jeremy is going to film through Zoom part of it, and if John comes in, he can take over. We do want to have all of these lectures posted on the Skowhegan History House uh, webpage. So um, we also have to thank the Federated Church for allowing us to use the space with, with no fee attached. It's a tremendous gift to us and to the community. And we certainly wanna thank all the presenters that have come before Chris Sokolexis because they've all done fabulous job. Um, I've just completed a, a uh, a survey in terms of, and you may get uh, a request to fill out the survey yourself. And it was just phenomenal, phenomenal, how, phenomenal, how um, wonderful it was. People really were very pleased, thought the content was good, were 100% behind all of the presenters. And, uh, you know, we couldn't have asked for a better review. So thank you. And now here's Susan, who's going to introduce Chris Sokolexis. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is our last scheduled meeting that we've had uh, for this whole series. And there has been a hardcore group of you who have been coming rather consistently, which is just great. Some people are missing, but I suspect that they're at home Zooming this. Um, and uh, I wanted to say before introducing Chris is that, um, we are hoping to continue these conversations. Uh, we're now off of our grant, so we, we will figure out how to get more speakers if we need to. But we also just wanted to have a conversation amongst those of us who've been pretty consistently attending these things, um, just to see where we wanna take all the information that we've, I feel like we've all taken a course in Wabanaki history and culture. And uh, it'll be, it, there are 
many places that we can take this information um, uh, in order to support and be true allies to the tribes. Um, so that will, we'll kind of, we, we've got your emails and we'll sort of let you know when we're gonna have meetings about that in the future. Um, so Chris is here for tonight, which has been great. And he is, to not totally healed, but that's only because he's a smoker. <laughs> and he um, and he has. Uh, I'm so grateful that he managed to pull this off despite having COVID. Um, he is uh, going to teach us more about the cultural history and archaeology within the traditional landscape of the Penobscot people, and he's going to include an overview of the archaeology of the archeological record mixed with some traditional stories. Um, he's a member of Penobscot Nation and he's their tribal historic preservation officer, which is really translated as tribal archeologist, right Chris? Yeah. <laughs> and he graduated from the UMO um, uh, anthropology department, but it's kind of, uh, he has a cousin who's an archeologist um, who, handed him all of his books at a very young age. And he's basically became, not only took some courses, but also educated himself about this. Um, and he also has uh, got a degree that came out of, was very involved with the Climate Change Institute at the university. Um, in addition, he's a singer and travels throughout New England with his drum group called the Res Dogs. And he loves being on the main rivers and is the lead or is one of the two lead contacts for the Penobscot, Natural, uh, Penobscot Nation Cultural Tourism Program up on the river. And these, 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 this program offers guided canoe trips uh, all along the Penobscot River. So, and that keeps him very, very busy all summer and into fall. <laughs> so welcome to Chris. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, don't worry about the COVID thing, that was two weeks ago. So I'm good now. <laughs> That's why we had to cancel two weeks ago. <laughs> so again, my name's Chris, I'm from the Penobscot Nation. Um, and I am the TIPO, so it's THPO is short for Tribal Historic Preservation Office. This is my 10th year doing that for the Penobscot Nation. Um, just a brief introduction on the program that I have. Um, any federally recognized tribe can have a THPO office. It's um, the funding comes through the Department of Interior National Park Service um, every year. And right now, I think we have about 700 and something TIPOs across the country. Um, so it's really neat to work with all these different tribes. Um, we come together during conferences and share ideas and projects and um, catch up with each other. So I've become fast friends with a number of them uh, across the country. So what we're gonna do is, uh, do the old running joke I like is we're going to run through 13,000 years in about an hour or so. Um, we'll start off, you know, with, with some uh, just cultural and history. I'll get into archaeology and then finalize um, the evening uh, with the PowerPoint, at least. Um, the work I've been doing with the National Park Service in the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. Um, that's been keeping me busy since 2017 um, as well. And then I'll end the program uh, with a couple of songs. Um, that we have written. Oh. I, I cannot get the thing to disappear. There we go. So Katahdin, you know, it's the greatest mountain. Um, we revere it, all the Wapanaki tribes here in Maine and um, into New Brunswick and Quebec revere this mountain, you know, it's a it's a centerpiece, you know, and literally, I guess, you know, it's in the center of Maine. So we have a lot of legends that um, are around this, you know, and they all start with Lukabe. Um, you know, he's one of our cultural icons, our teacher. Um, and here's a couple of very important things. You know, he owes his power, you know, this three teachings that are really, really strong. You know, the, your power comes from the great spirit. We're never we're told never to leave our homeland. 
um, which I haven't done yet. I've never traveled overseas. And never can forget your first mother, which is Mother Earth. So all these teachings are really Earth-based um, teachings that come from Gluskave himself. One of my favorites uh, is the shortened version. Gluskave slays the giant frog monster who was hoarding up all the water in the Penobscot watershed. So Gluskabe grabs the, you know, the people are starving, uh, dying of thirst, you know, because there's just no water. So Gluskabe grabs a tree and breaks the frog's back. And the water spews out, which forms what we know now as the Penobscot River watershed. And if you see the bullfrog today, you can see where Gluskabe snapped its neck because um, it has the hump on, the, on its back. And that's where Gluskabe struck the giant frog with, his, with the tree. This one's my ultimate favorite, um, one of the, you know, the old oral tradition, um, and it involves Gluskabe with the moose hunt, um, hunting up in uh, Moosehead Lake, what we know now is Moosehead Lake. Uh, he sees a giant moose and uh, her calf come upon him, and he uh, reaches down, grabs uh, this rock, fashions it into a, a, a spearhead, slays the moose um, after you know he makes this, the, uh, the the bow and arrow shaft and everything and he slays the moose and instantly that moose turns into what we know today as Mount Kineo. Um, and I love this image because it does look like a cow moose laying in the water itself. So this is Mount Kineo from, from a, a unique angle that you don't really see very often. And on the bottom is the rhyolite itself, Kineo rhyolite. Um, it's a very tough stone. Um, I flint nap, so I make stone tools, and I usually will go to Mount Kineo every year and load about 50, 60 pounds of rock in my backpack and have it for the year to make stone tools with. Um, I love working with the stone, even though it's so tough and hard to work with. Um, it's not as easy as like obsidian or, you know, chertz or jaspers, uh, but it's definitely, you, you'll see this stone in just about any archeological site here in Maine, as well as into New Hampshire, Vermont. So the trade un units were very vast, but this is a primarily the stone you're going to see in the archaeological sites. So when Gluskabe gets excited, he makes this, slays the moose, you know, throws down his, his pack basket, kicks over the his cooking kettle, and it turns up to be these two mountains, the Spencer Mountains, um, right there in the vicinity. And uh, as you can see, you know, Big Spencer is his, his pack, his pack basket, and the kettle itself that gets knocked over um, is Little Spencer Mountain. And these give us place names um, within our landscape to where, you know, we know these locations through oral traditions, um, not just here, but the story continues down to the coast, down into Penobscot Bay, he, where he chases the calf after slaying the cow, chases the calf to the coast, and then slays the calf, the calf down there, which becomes these very, very important travel routes, canoe routes. Um, he jumps across the bay from, uh, from the Northport uh, Belfast area, jumps across, and when he lands, he lands a snowshoe into Dice Head. So if you go to Dice Head and Castine, um, Oh. <laughs> um, you go to the go to the headlight and you go down onto the bedrock and look at the bedrock it's a dark bedrock but you see these quartz veins that run through it and they look they resemble snow the netting of a snowshoe landing in into the rock itself so he butches the moose right there saves the best part the you know the rump of the moose that turns into cape rosier um, they say don't eat moose liver even though it's delicious um, and he throws it into the, into the ocean, which we know now is Thrum Cap Ledge. Um, you can see it if you're on a boat going around uh, the western side of Deer Isle. You can see Thrum Cap Ledge, and this this rock is totally a different color than the other bedrock that's around there. Usually, it's like a granite, a um, little basalt, some rhyolite, but this you know is not the color that you see in Thrum Cap Ledge. This is actually a reddish, like red stained rock. Um, resembling a liver. And he throws the entrails to his dog across the bay. And that you can see on Islesboro, you can see the remnants of the moose entrails itself. And that's a, it's kind of like a, 
limestoney a little bit. And then there's another section of it that is like a banded rhyolite, which is really, really a really pretty rock. So what this, these help us with travel routes. So we're paddling down. So it's, you know, we're paddling down through, if you come down, you don't have to go down and around, you just shoot straight across. So if you want to go from Northport to Castine, you would hit Islesboro. And where that, uh, the entrails are, is the narrowest point on that island portage. And then you shoot straight across to Cape Rozier. Get into Thrum Cap, once you recognize Thrum Cap, take a left at Thrum Cap and it puts you up into the Bagaduce. And from the Bagaduce, you can go anywhere. Um, over to the Union, up, you know, just so you're not paddling the ocean constantly. Even coming down, you'll come down from the Bagaduce and just reverse it. Get to Thrum Cap, take a right and head straight across. So these help us with, with portages. Um, and in the Deer Isle, Deer Isle region, um, it's known as the Punch Bowl. There used to be a large bedrock there with a petroglyph on it. And that was a pretty significant marker showing how to get into the Bagadoos. Um, so it's, I wish it was still there. I've never seen it, I've only seen pictures. Um, and that shows you where to go up into the Bagadoos River area. Another one of my favorites is taken from just up river here as well. Um, Gluskabish slaying the giant serpent. So this one for me with my father's interpretive analysis focuses more on the Kennebec River uh, where this giant serpent was hoarding, again, hoarding uh, resources and Gluskabe slays the serpent. You know, he tries numerous times to shoot him with his arrow, kept bouncing off the scales, bouncing off the scales. So with the help of his uh, friend, the woodpecker, the woodpecker flies around, shows Gluskabe where to slay the monster. So he shoots him and he, if you can see at the end of the tail, there's an arrow and that's where the woodpecker told him to shoot the, the serpent itself. So once he does that, he breaks the serpent's back um, just with an arrow, serpent dies and out of the serpent itself um, comes all these living creatures, turtles, eels, all the water creatures um, come out of the serpent, um, all these resources. And this is just a quick picture of the peleated woodpecker. If you've seen one, they're huge. <laughs> we have some very big ones up river, like the size of crows. But again, this is just another image from uh, the rock, I call it. Um, I know locally it's called Indian rock, I've heard. Um, but it's just the petroglyph site just up river in uh, Emden area, Emden and Solon. And it's one of my favorite places to visit. You know, it's been going there researching with my father since right around 1985 doing interpretive analysis of these. Um, in the early days in the 80s, we got laughed at on some of our interpretations, um, even though we laughed at some of the archeologists with their interpretations, because they, they were totally wrong, <laughs> to be honest. And it was really nice to um, go there one last time with um, Mark Hedden, who used to be a state archeologist here. And then um, his, uh, his life research was nothing but petroglyphs from around the world. And to go there, one of his last trips there with him was very special to me because he would, you know, I've been there before with him and, he, you know, we take groups down and he'd talk about the petroglyphs. And that last one, he said, all right, it's your turn. And then just stepped aside and said, do your thing. Um, so it took almost 40 years for him to come around. Um, and that's what's happening in archaeology as well. Um, archaeology is now looking into traditional knowledge of, of Native tribes, you know, the, before they just dismissed oral traditions, you know, there's no scientific evidence. Um, but now archaeology is starting to come around. I think it's more and more with indigenous archaeology. Um, a lot of indigenous archaeologists are coming up. But I think it's just the new way of thinking. You know, the um, these old some of them still hang on to the old uh, the old ways. But um, some archaeologists here in Maine um, that I've known since I was a teenager as well that I still work with really are looking now into indigenous archaeology to help interpret uh, sites, archaeological sites, not just petroglyph sites, but sites in general. There's a couple more here. And again, these are um, interpreted by my father who spent many, many <laughs> weeks, I guess you'd say weeks on end. He would just go down and just stay there. Um, our family became really good friends with the Hodgson family. 
um, in Emden. And so my father was working with their father. Now I work with the kids. <laughs> so we're all about the same age. So it's, we're second generation trying to help preserve this rock um, and protect it as best we can. These are very, very fragile um, and can be damaged easy. You know, when we tell people when we visit sites, not just here in the Kennebec, but in Machias and Grand Lake, you know, remove your shoes if you kind of go onto the ledge so you're not grinding the dirt into it to uh, destroy the image even further because it's so shallow. And just the slightest um, hit with another rock, you could damage the whole, the whole image itself. But again, so see, these are some more of our creation stories. Um, that's Gluskabe slaying the, the last of the mammoth. The great white swan is um, the coming of Europeans. Um, and, the, and the tradition says, you know, Gluskabe says, you will see, you will know when the coming of the white man, because you'll see a giant white swan floating up the river. And instantly I think, well, if we're sitting there, you're seeing a full masted ship coming up, up the river. It's gonna look like a giant white bird. Um, and then we have the four companions, which is really our, a big part of our creation stories. Um, with the four companions, you have Guscabe, his grandmother, the young warrior hunter, and the, the, uh, the maiden, the corn maiden uh, herself. And each owes their existence to the elements where Guscabe is from the dust, uh, the grandmother's from the foam of the water. The young, the young man is from the dew with a stone, and the young maiden is the dew on the plants. And here we just have um, some different deities um, on the upper right. Um, I think it's right to you. <laughs> you see a birthing symbol. Um, I, this is our one of our major creation stories itself. I've edited it out. Um, it has a lot of phallic uh, features, vulvous features. And when I do this in school, I don't wanna have the kids laughing all the time. So it's, <laughs> I kind of edited it out, but it, it's a larger image. So I just kind of condensed it down to um, that universal birthing symbol is seen around the world. You see it in, in Australia, Africa, Scandinavia. So it's a universal um, symbol itself. And then down below are three just, deities um, that my father interpreted as the one on the bottom left, if I'm correct. Um, the one with his hand going up. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see this. Yeah. 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 Um, so we have, a, we have a, an oral story of um, this giant ogre um, who devours people and wears the bones on him. And one of his hands it's, uh, is extra large. And that's what he uh, and he holds a weapon in his other hand. The center one, um, I firmly believe with, along with Mark Hedden and his theories, um, is it's, it's a shaman. So there's various ways that um, we expressed ourselves, our shaman, you know, our shaman connecting to the higher powers, you know, the great spirit. One of them is the arrow on the head. And another one is, um, especially you see these in Machias where it's like a, a V. So it looks like, um, the old TV antennas coming off the head. And that's, that's their connection to the great spirit. So they're in, in a ceremony uh, connecting to the great spirit. And the last one on the bottom is my father interpreted these. These are all kind of scattered on the rock, but they're open primarily around our creation stories. Um, and he interpreted that as a mother earth symbol. Just because we see it within the creation story, you see it next to um, the serpent, you see it next, you know, so there's certain areas that you see this image over and over. And my favorite images from the Emden site, and you know, being an avid paddler, um, are the canoes. There's numerous canoes on this rock. Um, and my favorite one is the larger one, the Solo, um, in Esculscabe, um, heading north. So at the end of all of his teachings, he says, I'm going to head get in my canoe and head north and I'll come back in the, you know, in the time of need, when the time is right, I'll be back. So when you're standing on the rock itself, you are facing up river and uh, it looks like he's paddling away from you. Um, if you think outside the box a little bit. And the other image is Gluskabe traveling with his companions. Um, 
the dog is in the front. He has he has a dog companion that he travels with, and you can see the image of the dog itself in the front of the boat. And again, so I always think outside the box on a lot of things. So when you look at this, you can see Guscabe's back. That's that's his back. He's paddling away from you. And the way this image is going, and you're standing there, you're looking straight over up into the Mount Katahdin region, um, heading heading almost due north. And I use the image of our tribal, one of our tribal uh, elders, Butch Phillips, in a birch bark canoe just to simulate uh, what it would look like when someone's paddling away from you. So I usually start it as well at different ways. I never do this presentation the same way twice. I always like to start with, when I start with this, is picture where we are 20,000 years ago. We were underneath at least a mile of ice. Um, and we have, we have stories about that, living along those ice margins. And the hunting and gathering groups, um, our paleo ancestors were small. Uh, this image here is from the Maine State Museum. If you've been in there, this there, um, it's in their roundabout uh, uh, section. Uh, it's a it's an amazing picture, an awesome representation of what paleo lifestyle may have been like here in Maine. So as these glaciers start to retreat, um, the ocean follows with it. The land is depressed, and as the glaciers are retreating, the ocean is following right up on it. And you can see before the, before the glacial retreat, if you go down to Cherry Field and to the Blueberry Barrens, um, that's the end moraine and the ocean was right up to that. And the whole area in that region is nothing but glacial erratics, sizes of houses. Um, so these glaciers are very powerful, uh, powerful entities. You know, if they can move a rock the size of a house, and so as the glaciers retreat throughout, throughout the couple of thousand years there, the water follows with it. And again, we have what was, we know as the ancient ocean. And that is evident through the marine sediment clay, uh, the Brazumscot Formation. It's a beautiful, rich, rich clay, gray clay, very fine. And you can find that all the way up into Millinocket, up into the East Branch. Um, and into the West Branch now. Um, I was on a canoe trip in 2014, portaging the Northeast Carry from Moosehead Lake to the West Branch. And I looked down and there's just clay running down the stream on the side of the side of the trail. So I scooped some out <laughs> and took it back to UMO and showed them, say, hey, you know, this is where I found this up north. And they were like, where? And I said, Northeast Carry <laughs> up in Moosehead Lake. And they're like, whoa, okay that may change our map a little bit. They said they were gonna go up and investigate a little more. Mm -hmm. But up in the East Branch, you have this marine clay, a ton of eskers um, and fossilized shells within, within the, uh, the slate shale bedrock um, along the East Branch, specifically at Stair Falls. Um, you can find these, these uh, fully full shells fossils right into the bedrock. Um, they're really, really neat to see. So over time, the land rebounds back up and the ocean drops to its low stand. So this is roughly around 9,000, 9,500 years uh, BP before present. And at, on this map, on the very black line on the bottom, that's the extent where we think the low stand was. So that was all land. So mo much of the, uh, out into the Gulf, so to speak, um, a mile or two, that's a rough guesstimate of, you know, you could go to Castine, step off the dock and just continue walking. Um, and as evidence of that brought up through scallop draggers, they're, they're still hauling up artifacts um, in their drag nets, um, which is really, really neat uh, to see. You know, uh, the Maine State Museum has a very nice collection that was donated by one Fisher family. Beautiful spearheads, large groundstone tools, um, just really, really neat. And they said they were half mile to a mile out <laughs> dragging their scallop draggers and finding, pulling up artifacts. So paleo tools, they had to be sharp. Um, these are made from volcanics. So here in Maine, um, 
with us, our volcanics are obviously Mount Kineo is a volcanic with the rhyolite. Monsungan Mountain, which is that beautiful red, uh, large red uh, lateral flaked. And then we have Norway Bluff as well, which is uh, a little ways from, it's still considered the Monsungan Formation, but it's not red. It's like a gray and black banded uh, chert. And it's, that's a really beautiful stone as well. And then there's smaller outcrops like along the East Branch up into the Savoys. Uh, they call it the Wasatiqua Formation. And it's just nice, nice black chert like. Um, and again, it's another beautiful stone to work with. And we are looking for source material for that. <laughs> As we speak, we, we saw a little bit this year working up in there, but next year we're really gonna go up and um, see if we can find the source of this material. So spearheads are large. They had to be from volcanic, very, very sharp. Um, some are fluted, which means you're taking a center flute channel out of the middle, you make your spearhead, and then you take that final flute out of the middle there. And others are called lateral flaked. So instead of taking the flute, they're just this ticking away laterally and making these razor sharp serrated, uh, serrated blade. And it's both techniques are really hard. Um, I'm more better at the lateral flaking than trying to take a flute out. I was, last one I tried, I broke. So it's very frustrating when you get a beautiful spearhead and you be like, oh, okay, here we go. And then you snap it. I always like this image. Um, these are the animals that our paleo ancestors were hunting here in North and uh, Central America. Um, if you see the ghost of the man, um, the artist rendition, that's his average, what, what he thought the size of a human was at the time compared to what we were hunting. So we, you know, here we do have evidence in North America of, you know, mastodon, um, giant sloth, armadillos, uh, short-nosed bear. I mean, all these are extinct now, you know, saber cats. Um, so it's really, really neat to see what was roaming uh, during this time period through, um, through, you know, excavating uh, these large, large animals. And for me, I didn't really, when I was younger, I was like, nah, there was no giant sloth. And I stuck with that. And then I realized, you know, later, and then going to the Smithsonian, um, turn, you know, you walk through the Natural History Museum and there's a giant sloth skeleton right there. You know, it stood about 13 feet tall. It was just huge. And I was like, yep, okay, they're here. <laughs> they were here, you know, but we have mammoth sites here in Maine as well. You know, we have one in Western Maine and another mammoth site in Southern Maine, um, which is very, very interesting. So as we travel through time, you know, we're, Kin groups are getting a little bit bigger, getting into where, where we know what Maine looks like now, today, um, before, you know, after the ancient ocean, after the low stand, the ocean's coming back up through natural climate change. The environment's getting warmer, glaciers are melting. So you're getting this natural sea level rise, not as advanced as today, um, where we're contributing to it. Um, with everything that we do. <laughs> um, so it was a natural sea level rise. And technology and thoughts really, really become uh, not vastly different, but improved. So our ancestors are realizing, hey, we can live off the rivers, streams, and the ocean was a big one. Um, so we're looking at we don't know exact dates on canoes, when dugouts were used, when birch barks come in, um, skin boats, you know, um, there's no definitive way to, uh, to date those. I mean, you can radiocarbon date to a certain degree, but you're gonna get the age of the tree, not the age of when it was made, um, basically. So we're utilizing um, the oceans, especially the oceans, you know, and we have here in Maine, it's called the, the Maritime Archaic. Um, along the Gulf of Maine into New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Still hunting and gathering on, on, you know, for terrestrial animals and plants, but fishing again, new resources of um, sustenance. Um, one big one that we do find along the coast in the, the last few remaining archaic shell mounds that we have left is swordfish. 
Um, so you definitely need a large boat <laughs> to go out into the Gulf of Maine because during this time period, you know, the environment was a little warmer and we're getting out of that low stand. So you still got the reaches coming around. You got Cape Cod exposed and then you got Georgia's bank being exposed. So that just that narrow chute coming through the middle of them into the Gulf of Maine. So the Gulf of Maine is warmer than it is today. We don't have all that cold current coming in like we do now. And there's a lot of evidence of swordfish coming in to bask, to spawn and do what they do as fish and hunting them, you know, provided a lot of meat and a lot of tools. Um, you can make tools out of, the, out of the bones themselves. Other evidence that we see in shell mounds are marine mammals, seals, um, fish, obviously, porpoise, um, the big ones, you know, shad, alewife, and stuff like that. And I love this artist's rendition of this guy fishing out in the open water. I can imagine what it's like because I was in a, in a canoe, open canoe in Moosehead Lake um, during a very bad wind rainstorm. And we had easily three to four foot rollers. And it was very, very nerve wracking to be in an open boat paddling in that. So I couldn't imagine trying to haul in a couple of hundred pound fish into the middle of the boat in the middle of that. Um, we're just more nervous about just getting to where we needed to go. So our archaic ancestors are still making the large flake stone tools, spearheads, you know, we're getting into arrowheads as well. Um, and that's another one that's another million dollar question is when did the bow and arrow come about? When did we, you know, switch from spears and atlatls to the bow and arrow? But the major transition going to that is this ground stone technology. So we got, you know, gouges are used like modern day chisels. Adds are used like modern day axes. Plummets are sinker weights for nets. And then ground slate, um, which is a delicate stone. And I firmly believe that within the archaeological record, that's more made, were made for ceremonial purposes uh, rather than util, you know, utility purposes, like, like an axe or a gouge. So that just provides evidence of woodworking, whether you're making canoes, um, village sites start to appear in this large, very large village sites. Um, start to appear in this time period as well. So population growth is, is coming up. And bone tool production. Again, so this is uh, swordfish harpoons. Um, this is from a site in Blue Hill um, that I had the pleasure of working on um, with my mentor and professor and good friend, Brian Robinson from the University of Maine, as well as Art Spies and uh, the state archaeologist. Uh, the three of us had a really nice time. This is a DOT project in Blue Hill. And these are from the burials themselves. We didn't excavate. The burials were excavated in the 1930s. And these are what was taken out of some of the graves um, with, the, with the, uh, the bodies themselves. And they're spectacular. You know, if you hold a tool made from a swordfish and you hold a tool made from moose or bear, you can tell the difference just in weight alone. The swordfish is so dense, so heavy, mm. and very sharp still. <laughs> um, I had the, uh, the bottom harpoon, that point is very sharp. I'm curious, I just wanna see how sharp things are when I work in the field, and I poked myself with it, and it, it went in. Um, so it's still razor sharp after hmm, 3,000 years, roughly. Yeah. So during this time period as well, we have what is known as the red paint tradition. Um, the red paint people of Maine is another one. So it's an intensive use of red ochre, you know, this iron rich mineral um, that when you crush it, it turns into a powder and it stains for a very long time. Um, so these were used in our burials. So we have this burial tradition to where some archaeologists are still saying that modern day Wabanakis are not affiliated with the red paint people of Maine. Um, he still says it to this day. He made his career out of it, <laughs> even though we've proved him wrong so many times. Um, so it's a burial tradition. And with that, you know, if we're not related, specifically speaking from Penobscot, if Penobscots aren't related to the red paint people of Maine, why are the majority of the red paint burials within the Penobscot River? 
Um, there are some scattered out other, other places, you know, up in Port Chois, Cow Point, up in Canada, you know, there's some in Vermont. Um, but the bulk of these burials are within the Penobscot River. And the place where we go to gather it is Old Lemon Island. Um, and that's named Old Lemon Island, is, it translates to the place of the, we gather red ochre. Um, and then you have in other places like um, Katahdin Ironworks as well. Um, you can get not only the red ochre, but there's other colors as well. I've seen, you know, yellow ochre, um, it's kind of orange. But these were used most specifically for burial purposes. So when the ancestors passed away, we'd coat the bodies with the ochre, bury them with tools, you know, in a birch bark shroud, excuse me, with tools. Um, so they would have those tools ready for them in the next life. They won't have to, I always kind of joke is like, yeah, my next life, I got to go back up to Kenya and collect more rocks, come back down, <laughs> make my tools, you know? So I, you know, they'd already have them tools for use. Um, and again, these, these burials to also help disprove some of these older archeologists is how do we know over a 5,000 year span to keep going to the same place to bury our dead right up until just before contact. We were going to uh, the same burial sites. And you can see it in, this, in the, you know, the stratigraphy, the layers of time um, going, the, you know, the oldest on the bottom, going right up through, right up until um, just, before, just before contact. And it's still done today by certain families. Um, my family's one of them. Um, I buried my father with red ochre tradition, red paint tradition. Um, another family, the Neptune family, buried their patriarch uh, with the same style. He was in a birch bark shroud with the red ochre and the tools um, as well. And I have my stuff ready. <laughs> I know it sounds kind of grim, but um, when I pass, I have my red ochre already and I already have my tools picked out that I want to be buried with. But it's a really, really interesting tradition. And these tools that are coming out are immaculate. Um, we repatriate a lot, as many as we can, through um, NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves uh, Protection Repatriation Act. It was established in 1990. And any federally funded institution has to look at their catalog and return items for funerary objects objects of cultural patrimony, um, anything that's vital like that has to be returned to a tribe if they can provide in information to say, yes, we are connected to these graves. So here in Maine, again, some of these archeologists want to discourage that because the museums that have these items are big museums that don't want to give up a collection, mainly Harvard. Um, <laughs> they want their collection. And um, when the site I worked on in, in Blue Hill was excavated in the 30s, um, it was a lot of the materials were brought to Harvard. Um, but Moorhead spread the wealth. More and Moorhead just spread the wealth and artifacts got spread all over the country. Harvard had the largest um, inventory, um, especially with the human remains that were excavated. And this site was really, really important it was a it was a spring you know fishing site very large village site habitation with the burials there and underneath the burials it wasn't just red ochre you know you're in the you're in the shell mound but there was a thin layer of fish and then the red ochre um, so underneath each grave burial was a layer of fish um, fish uh, itself I jokingly call them fish patties um, trying to avoid them yeah. as best we could when we were working down there. Um, we did have to excavate a little portion into the burial site itself. And we were super, super careful. Um, even though all, most of the individuals were buried or excavated, there's still a couple that were there, they were left. And buyers who led the excavations wrote in his journals that the bones were too far decayed um, to exhume. So they left them there. And that's how I argue with projects like that one, the bridge project there, um, saying it's still an active burial. 
you know, not everyone was exhumed from there. There's still children um, buried in there. And that's the significant site. Part about that site in Blue Hill is the majority of the burials were children. So it was very, very powerful to me to, to work on there. You know, I've been fascinated with red paint tradition for a very long time. And to actually work on a site was just very thrilling. You know, to me, you know, as careful as we were, um, it was really, really neat. And to get back to the repatriation, uh, in 2016, we actually repatriated from the RSP body in Andover, all the grave goods, all the funerary objects from the Blue Hill site, the Nevin site itself. And since 1990, <laughs> um, what we have is the Wabanaki Repatriation uh, Committee. So it's representatives from each tribe here in Maine and New Brunswick. We have worked together to repatriate um, our ancestors' home for reburial. And we take them to our location for reburials. Um, but they've been fighting with Harvard since the late 80s on returning these human remains, our ancestors. And... I kept bringing it up when I became TIPO. I kept bringing it up because I know a couple of people at Harvard and who work in the Peabody Museum there. And I'm like, how's that in heaven? How's, you know, keep bothering them. And they, well, you got to prove affiliation. So finally we did, you know, after all these years. Um, in 2019, no, to 2020, we went down to Harvard and brought home not only the individuals from Nevin, but we came home with over 125 um, ancestors. <laughs> that they had 125 individuals wow. down there, um, so we brought them home, all all of them home. It was a very healing moment. It was, you know, it was wow. full of emotion. Um, but Harvard finally said, "We're just going to return return them to you," because they they knew that our SP body already returned the grave goods um, a couple of years before. So um, I worked with a, a Mi'kmaq spiritual elder. We rebundled every grave funerary object, grave good with each individual um, that she said, how are you gonna do that? And here I am with three computers, <laughs> um, Excel spreadsheets everywhere with all the burials, everything. Um, and I said, I can guarantee you, I'm gonna put every artifact back with each individual um, through the catalog numbers. Um, as they were exhumed. And I'm so thankful that um, buyers kept great records uh, back in the 1930s because a lot of archaeologists didn't. You know, they didn't just, they didn't keep a record. You know, they just came in these shell mounds with clam rakes and just plowed right through them. Um, but he was diligent in his excavations and his record keeping. He hand drew two scale maps of each individual burial, each individual grave, each individual. <laughs> Like we're talking the human remains, the tools. I mean, he hand drew everything. Um, and it's amazing to um, just see those. Uh, just each, each one of them. It's just really, really intense to see. And, and, it, and it's a, an important tradition that we can finally tell some of these archeologists, yeah, we are the red people, paint people of Maine. <laughs> Indian Island, our reservation island um, is a red paint burial island. We just... <laughs> Um, you know, Oak Hill was excavated, cemetery was excavated in the 1950s to put a road in. Uh, 2010, we we're working on water sewer lines and came across four burials we didn't even know about. Um, there's a burial in my neighbor's yard out behind my house when they were putting in his driveway, another red paint burial. Um, so th that's our argument, you know, and then we have numerous burials across the river in Old Town as well, you know, and this is our, this is us, this is who we are, you know, and it's really, really neat to, to be able to say that. But as we transition into another period, time period here, um, known as the woodland period or ceramic period um, as well, village sites are huge. Um, you know, population growth, you know, you have the main villages, you're traveling on the waterways to get to your hunting and, you know, your satellite hunting camps, fishing areas and then coming back to the main village to live as well. Um, Old Town was a huge, huge site, excuse me, for, for Penobscot, just amazing. You know, it's like 
Marsh Island, you know, where University of Maine is, was pretty much our habitation island. And Indian Island was our burial island. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic that when, you know, the government comes in, well, that's your reservation. They put us on our cemetery, within our cemetery. Um, I was kind of, again, I think outside the box a little bit and be like, yes, yeah, fitting. You know, they want us to go away. So they put us on a burial island. A um, yeah. little bit of weird, dark humor in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is the pretty much the standard tool kit. Again, we're still making these large flake stone tools, still doing ground stone tools in this time period. But the specialties become a little bit finer, more refined, especially with bow and arrows, with arrowheads themselves, a whole wide range of different styles. Um, most common here in this area uh, is the side and corner notched. Once you get on the other side of the Kennebec River, you see them, but they change a little bit um, as you get into Western Maine, Southern Maine, into New England, really vast changes in the artifact styles. Um, you see these Labana triangles, um, primarily in Southern Maine into New England. Um, really, really neat barbed points um, called Jack's Reef um, out of Massachusetts. It's just amazing. But up, up, you know, up in the north and east of the Kennebec River, so to speak, is the side and corner notched. You see them all over the place. And all of these, except for the triangles, um, we excavated in 2006. Um, we worked at a site um, in Gouldsboro and for a field school and all the scrapers and the bottom so corner and side notch come out of units that I worked on personally so it's really really neat to to have that stuff and scrapers again scrapers go back to the paleo ancestor time and basically they're just modified flakes you know you just take a random piece of the flake debris that you're not going to use and uniface it. So instead of bifacing it like a like an arrowhead, you know, you're taking pieces off each side of the stone. You're only taking pieces off one side of the stone. And you produce this razor sharp edge, um, and it's be used for scraping, scraping meat off bone, fat off hides. Um, just a utilitarian um, use for it as a scraper. Most of these scrapers that I found here were right around a fire hearth with moose bone, um, right there. So you had the fire hearth, bunch of scrapers, moose bone. Um, quartz wedges, they call them. That's, they're just kind of like um, triangle shaped quartz, but they're used to split bone with, to scoop out the marrow, to eat the marrow. One big advancement um, going from the archaic, even though they did have bone tools in the archaic, not as prominent as in the woodland period. Um, Again, these are all from Jones Cove as well uh, in Gouldsboro. And I spent my whole <laughs> spring break sitting in the Abbey Museum, just looking at simple bone points every day, eight hours a day, just like looking at simple bone points. I was fascinated by them. They're, they come in all shapes and sizes. Some are barbed. Um, and there's no real explanation for them. Um, they're on average, couple inches long. Um, some, are, some are larger, which we know those are for fishing spears um, to put them into the Leicester spears themselves. But these smaller ones, you know, where they, for shucking clams, um, we don't know. I mean, is they, maybe they're fishing lures. Um, those are a couple of theories. One of my theory I threw out there that uh, my professor get a good chuckle at is, I thought they were gaming pieces. They, you know, you're sitting in your wigwam all winter not much to do. You got to, you know, do something. So I, I figured they were like gaming pieces, gambling pieces of some sort. Um, some, you know, some are elaborately marked, you know, maybe those are worth more than just the plain ones. You know, I, I had this whole running uh, theory with him that we'd love to sit down after, after the day and just talk shop. Um, but bone points, again, they're just in all shapes and sizes. Harpoons we're still making. Um, these harpoons on the bottom are not swordfish. Uh, we believe they were bear or moose. And then awls and an actual fish hook as well, uh, made from bone. Um, awls are for perforating. So you, you're poking holes in birch bark. Um, if you're making canoes or wigwams or clothing. And then 
the tiny ones on the bottom, the very tiny ones, says bone points and harpoon, those are miniatures. So it, it wasn't really for any use. That harpoon in the center on the, in the bottom there is about an inch long. <laughs> like, it, I don't know what you're gonna hunt and kill with, a, with an inch long harpoon. Uh, so they were like just random, probably, again, someone sitting in the wigwam, you know, kind of bored and just fiddling around with old bone. And you have to, when you utilize uh, bone to do this, it has to be fresh. Um, especially with, you know, it's easier to carve for one, but these larger points, these bone points were used for, as for, like I said, for fishing spears, um, leister spears for, you know, ground fishing and, and whatnots like that. And they had to have been made of bone. Um, these long, very long, long spears, uh, spear tips, so to speak. Um, I always like to say that make them out of bone, like a theory, again, I threw at my professor, you know, if you're using a bone tool, a stone tool in a fishing spear, you're constantly hitting the ground, you're just going to snap. And again, you got to go all the way back up to Kineo, get the stone, come all the way back down. With bone, if you snap it while you're fishing, you make another one after dinner. I mean, it's that simple. So I think that's why the bone tools became so abundant. I mean, in all the shell mound sites along the coast of Maine, bone tools are just by the thousands. Um, they just, and they, that was my undergrad fascination was bone tools. And then my grad school fascination became uh, red paint with the, with the Nevin site. But again, these come in all shapes, different sizes. And it's just really, really intriguing that that much use, you know, comes out of an animal. It's not just for eating. You're making tools as well out of the bones. And here we are. This is why it's called the Woodland Ceramic Period is the introduction of pottery. Um, it's firmly believed that pottery followed agriculture um, from the south and west up into this region. Um, some of the earliest archaeology with ceramics and agriculture comes from um, cent like Central America, Mexico area. Southern, southern US, um, especially within the Mississippi River, uh, huge cities, city sites, tens of thousands of people living in one area, all doing agriculture and pottery and stone tools and bone tools as well. But here in Maine, um, this is the standard. You'll never really find a complete clay pot. Um, they don't last well. And it goes again to how we're not you know, we're becoming more uh, stationary. You know, we're staying in one place longer. And clay pots are sometimes, you know, little cooking pots like this. And then there are large storage pots that we have. Um, in our museum on Indian Island, we have a very large pot that someone tried to re <laughs> recreate. Um, and it's, it's about, yeah, it's about that big, about three feet, two and a half, three feet. And the indentations in it. I'm not a huge... Um, person to talk about with the indentations and in pottery itself, uh, my friend and predecessor, Bonnie Newsom, who is now a, a professor at UMO, uh, that was her specialty and I loved learning. I love sitting with her and talking about it. So some of these are, could have been family groups marking, you know, marking their own pots um, or just plain old decorations um, using cord wrap stick, like in the top center um, or, um, just like a braided paddle, you know, they would just wrap the, the fabric or the, uh, the grasses or sinew around a flat surface and just press the whole thing into it, as you can see on the bottom there. But I always like the, the top center. I, I like that cord wrap stick look to it. Um, and usually it's right around the rims of the, the pots themselves or the whole pot is usually covered too, um, especially with the paddle. And it's just beautiful. I mean, if it's really, really neat to, to see, but um, you really got to know what you're looking for, I guess, so to speak. If you're in a shell mound, you know, is it pottery? Is it a rock? Is it a chunk of mud? Um, so you really got to uh, know what you're looking for in that. And she taught me so much uh, when I worked for her. When she was THPO, um, I worked for her in the summer times, uh, going out and doing excavations when she couldn't get out into the field. And fishing, again, it's still huge. Um, fishing by weirs and nets, as you can see here. Um, I love this old style photo. And 
fishing like that is you set up the rock line. We, we have a couple of them in the Penobscot River still. Um, set up your rock line, tide comes in, tide goes out, the fish get stuck behind the rocks. And then that's where you're coming out with the spears um, and ground fishing from there like that. And then nets. Um, again, we have the plummets, um, which are net sinker weights. Um, and again, it's the same way, tidal. I remember seeing as a kid, you can still see, still see the net posts, but um, we drive down to Eastport when I was, you know, I used to live down there too when I was a kid. And they were still fishing with the tidal nets, which is really, really neat to see. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they still are today, but the, the posts are still there. You can still yeah. see the posts when the tide's just right. Yeah. So in the shell mounds themselves, these are the primary uh, fish that we're seeing. Um, shell mounds are made up from clam shells, oysters, scallops, uh, mussel. We're seeing all those shells. Sea urchin, we're seeing in there as for shells. Um, pretty much everything but lobster is what we're seeing um, in a shell mound. And the top of the fish is, these are the bulk of the fish we're seeing. Um, not so much swordfish in this time period, because again, the ocean's risen at least five meters over a couple of thousand years. Um, so George's Bank and the very ends of Cape Cod are underwater now. So the Gulf of Maine's flooding in. Um, but we're seeing these, you know, shad, alewife, getting chased by tom cod. That's why we see a lot of see a lot of tom cod in. Um, but cod back then were very much larger than they are today, um, just due to uh, over exploitation of of fishing and agriculture in this period, time period. And again, you know, we have the, the, the three sisters, they call it, you know, corns, beans, and squash. Um, but we also have for, with us, um, especially with the Penobscot in the river, we have what we call ground nuts, which is like a miniature potato. Um, it's really, really delicious when you saute it up with garlic and, and oil and stuff. But there, you know, that's kind of a starchy, uh, vegetable that you got to kind of uproot out um and we didn't really have intensive agriculture but we had agriculture here in maine um not as intense as you will see in the ohio river valley you know mississippi river valley um where it was highly intense it seems like that's all they relied upon was agriculture we're here we're still doing hunting and fishing um, and then we get into contact um here we see, you know, I always do the, the three G's in contact, you know, gods, guns, and germs. And, and that's the big thing that happens here, you know, is trading routes. You know, we traded back and forth before European contact, highly traded. We have a lot of exotic stones. I call them exotic stones from New York, Vermont, Canada. Um, and then they have our stones there as well you know, back and forth and all these sites. So trade was really huge for us. And these little trade areas became more and more. Um, I firmly believe that we traded more with the French than we did with the, with the English. Mm. Um, we worked on a site. I helped uh, my professor do one of his last field schools in Machias Bay area. And we we're working on a late woodland period site and we're digging in the shell mound. You know, you're just seeing regular stuff and all of a sudden a brass crucifix appears um, with brass beads. We've got brass tacks, French lead glazed pottery, um, a chamber pot that <laughs> it's funny, the students didn't want to touch. And I'm like, oh, yeah. it's been in the ground for <laughs> a couple of hundred years. I, th I think all the stuff has gone from it, you know, because I was trying to put it back together and they're like, oh, you're touching it. It's like, I'm already dirty. We've been in the, in the mud for a month now. Um, but we think we found a French Passamaquoddy trading post um, in that area. And um, Donald Soctoma was excited about it because it, it's near a petroglyph site as well. Um, but to see this, you know, it's just really, really neat to see, you know, maybe we did find a trading post um, with that. And we come up into today, you know, we still through a lot of the customs, traditions, you know, we're still sharing our oral stories, our oral tradition down to the next generations. Uh, we're still making baskets. We still make birch bark canoes. 
um, you know, with our ceremonies, with regalias, um, in the bottom there with the uh, deer antler headdress, that's my dad. Um, he was a powwow dancer, you know, he grew up dancing. Um, and then the lower corner is me in Machias, uh, about four centimeters away from realizing I just opened up a, a dog burial <laughs> in a shell mound. So, um, which is really neat. I don't know if it was a good dog or a really good dog. So it could have been a pet or it could have been dinner. So we're not too sure on that. I think it was dinner because it was, wasn't articulated. It was just, you know, the mandible, some, uh, some paws and a couple of vertebrae and that was it. So I think it was dinner that was tossed into the shell, into the shells for disposal. But again, you know, we pass on all the stuff that we've learned, even stone tool making, you know, like for me, I'm one of a handful of flint nappers from, from, you know, our communities. Um, it's just an art form that needs to be continued on. Um, every time we re <laughs> repatriate something uh, back from institutions, uh, I always want to take pictures, not of the human remains, but of the artifacts themselves and try to recreate and replicate them. Mm -hmm. um, especially with the daggers in the Nevin site. Uh, I forgot to mention that. I took them out of here. I don't know why. Um, the burials, the children's burials, usually with red paint burials, it's stone tools. So you have these nice ground slate daggers with the Nevin site in Blue Hill. All the children didn't have those. They had moose bone daggers um, and they were incised with geometric patterns. Um, so some of my work is trying to figure out what those patterns are. Are they kin groups, which I believe firmly believe they are. Um, but with that, again, as soon as I saw them, I'm like, I, I need to make some of these. So I have about six moose legs in a deep freezer right now, um, ready to get uh, cleaned and uh, shaved. But again, we're, so we're still doing a lot of these traditions, which is really, really awesome to, um, to see uh, people in there. That's that, that's this 13,000 years and about an hour, yeah, it was close. Um, I'll just show you some highlights of what I've been doing in the last, uh, since the monument <clears throat> became a monument in 2016. Um, we started work immediately in 2017 to get up in there um, to do archeology. span You know, we did our research. We're all very excited about this new monument. It is definitely not Acadia National Park. So um, if you're gonna go up in to visit Katahdin Woods and Waters, be prepared, um, bug nets, deet, um, <laughs> and a lot of hiking. This hiking, biking, horse, horse trails, um, and a loop road. You know, this, you can drive up in there as well. Um, but it's been really, really fun to work with the National Park Service archeologists um, up in here and um, gives us a chance. There's not a lot of places to do archeology span where you don't need to be in a canoe. That's what I love. <laughs> so you get a canoe to a lot of places to get to where we need to go. Um, this is us heading up the East Branch where we're heading to the big Savoy's campsite um, to investigate it. Um, it's a known site. You know, we started with our background research. Where are the existing sites that we know about? And then now we're going out to different, well, this may be so, you know, we're looking at the landscape and determining, is this suitable for a site? And um, which we have, we've, we've actually come across a new site. I was up there in 2021, so it was, yeah, last year, working with the Wabanaki Youth and Science Camp and came across the cache of Monsungan, bright, beautiful red Monsungan flakes. And I was, took a GPS, sent it to the Park Service. I was, we need to go check this out. And this year we went up and um, actually did some excavations. Um, and we believe we have a new site that's gonna be listed in the, uh, in the record. And this is all of us, um, various times, um, just working. Most of the, the two top ones are from the Big Savoy's campsite. So we were at, we're about, <laughs> go to the end of the end of those trees, it drops straight down, straight to the river. So you got to hike the trail that goes up to the top, which is really, really cool. But it's, again, it's a known site, um, not just pre-contact, but historic site as well. Um, 
someone had a little homestead on top of this hill and there's remnants of that homestead mm -hmm. um, up in there. And we hiked through the woods with um, our good friends, locals, Eric and Elaine, who were in the bottom center, um, orange jacket, green jacket. These two will get you lost within 10 seconds <laughs> because they'll be like, all right, here we go. Um, we're walking along a trail and all of a sudden Eric takes a right and we're bushwhacking through you know, all this stuff. And he comes across a campsite. He knows where all these sites are, like an old historic campsite, um, just remnants. You know, you see a wood stove or you see, you know, logging tools, you know, old chunks of metal and cans. We found a bottle of gin that we dared each other to uh, take a drink of. It was corked still. <laughs> we don't know how long it's been there. And we did open it and I instantly closed it. It stunk so bad. But we're joking around. You drink it. No, you drink it. Um, but this is all of us. This is James Nyman uh, next to me in the green coat. He is the lead archaeologist for the National Park Service Region 1 here in the Northeast. Um, great guy. Really, really fun to work with. And that's us at Orin Falls up in the Wasatiquit stream. Um, it's a beautiful hike if you get up in there. Uh, roughly, it's around 10, 10 to 12 miles round trip from your car in and out. Uh, which isn't bad. You really don't realize how long it is. Um, it's just you're walking along with Sadaqua Stream, and it's just so beautiful. Yeah. And there's beautiful hiking trails in the northern parcel, um, uh, the Du Bois parcel, the following. So this is the bulk of it. Um, the main road comes in, cuts through, and then you hit the loop road on the on the bottom square there. A lot of it's backcountry. Um, there's no roads, just trails, hiking trails. And then you have the river corridor um, that's amazing. And then the Savoy's camp uh, site itself is really, really neat. Um, an outside investor put cut and made brand new trails for that. And they did such an awesome job. Um, all the other stuff is rustic, rustic trails, rustic camping. Um, if you're lucky, you get a, a lean to because <laughs> um, the uh, International Appalachian Trail runs through the monument as well. So it picks up at Katahdin where the Appalachian Trail drops off, cuts through the monument, goes into Canada, and then reconnects over in um, Spain, I believe. And it ends with that last, um, they made a movie of it. Mike, Mike Douglas was in it. Um, but it's the International Appalachian Trail. And it's really, really wild. We're in these remote areas thinking, oh, we're the only ones around. And all of a sudden, someone pops out of the woods with a backpack. And you're like, oh, hey, look out. Um, so it is really, really remote, but I highly go visit it. It is just beautiful. So these are some of the sites that we have worked on. And these are some of the artifacts that we have come out. Um, looking at really, really some beautiful stone, um, primarily Kineo Rhyolite, again, um, from Mount Kineo is brought over. And then you have Traveler's Mountain just north of the monument, um, which they call it Traveler's Rhyolite. And unlike Kineo, which is nice green, um, the Traveler's Rhyolite, it's more gray with black phenocryst crystals uh, structures in them. Then these, again, these are some of the sites here. Um, the Wasatiquit Formation, again, that's that beautiful black shirt. Um, that's a Kineo uh, biface. And then the Traveler's, you can see the difference. Even though the Kineo is a little sun washed out, um, but you can definitely tell the difference in the in the materials of them. And I was paddling on the East Branch and pulled over my kayak for a quick break, looked down, and I found a ground slate hand knife um, there as well. Uh, perfectly shaved down. So it's almost like a like an ulu knife that the Inuit used to to process seals and, and whales and whatnot. But it's slate, um, ground slate which is really, really amazing. So again, this is uh, two of my favorite places on the East Branch. Lung Sioux Camps, looking downstream, and then Big Savoy's campsite, looking upriver. Um, I, I just love that view of on the beach, and you're just going to have some fun. But Lung Sioux, you can drive into. Big Savoy's, you got to paddle to. So if you're feeling adventurous, you go up to Long Sioux and then you paddle upstream for about a mile and a half-ish uh, and you come to the Big Savoy's campsite. And that is all I have for wow. that. Ooh. 
Thank you. So I'm not sure how you want to do this part. This is going to take a quick second. That's that? Yeah. See if we can do this. Oh, I thought it was going to be just me. Yep, yeah, no, you're good. Uh, the, uh, the screen is showing your slideshow still, but this is what we're seeing. Oh, this? So Let's just X that out. Yeah. Or just minimize it. I think you can. Yeah, try Xing it out. Questions. Um, just kind of repeat the question. Like, yeah, all that's that's what everyone's yeah. saying. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now that we get that uh, uh, settled out of the way, <laughs> are there any questions that we can take from either in house or from online or wherever? Yeah, I'll just go over to like right around the room. Um, okay. Here. Is there any evidence? about how big those fish were. I know from the Gulf of Samoa, there are evidence of 2,000, 2,500 members of those fish species in the earlier periods. Is there any evidence of that here? Um, sizes of fish in that time period. Definitely larger um, with the tom cod. We're seeing the vertebrae change. Like you go from vertebrae sizes changes dramatically. Um, throughout time, but today they just got overfished, you know, not just by natives, but Europeans as well. So now the tom cods we have today are definitely smaller. They don't have that time to grow, you know, they're constantly just being fished, fished out. But you can definitely see it in the, ver in the uh, vertebrae sizes, how it just kind of just got smaller and smaller. Just repeat the questions. Today. Oh, I thought I did. All right. I'll do it. All right. We'll just go right around through. Yeah. I was wondering if um, it sounds like the time was in the water is working much more with the tribe. And so it's almost like it's kind of a collaboration between the Wabanaki and the National Park. Is that possible? It is. So the question was um, the woods and Katahdin Woods and Waters working with tribes? Yes. Uh, Penobscot Nation has been working with the National Park Service since day one. Um, other tribal communities, Passamaquoddy, Micmac, Malice, come in a little bit later, like a year or two later. But we've been right from the get-go. We've been involved. One, it's our traditional homeland, you know, so it's our traditional landscape. Um, we have direct evidence of that, um, of certain, you know, some of our families living along the Wasatic, living in the East Branch, living, in, you know, in the Katahdin region. Um, and living over in Moosehead Lake. So that whole area is definitely what we consider our traditional landscape. And it's been great working with them. You know, they, I said it often in the early meetings and I still say it every once in a while, but you know, we're setting the standards. Um, really there's no other national park or national monument where a tribe has been involved since day one. Um, they're involved in tribes now, you know, bringing them into the fold, but we've been there right from the inception when Secretary Zinke came up to first visit it, um, we paddled him and his entourage down, down the East Branch, um, wow. so to speak. Um, really nice guy. His politics were horrible, but you get him away from politics, he's a nice guy. <laughs> but no, we did it. In all four tribes today, you know, we're working on, um, we have a working group with the, with the uh, historic preservation offices and, you know, chiefs and councils and, um, and other you know, people within culture departments and stuff like that, working directly with the park service on developing foundation document for it, management plans. Um, we're working on the unigrid, they call it. Basically it's the, the, the map 
and all that stuff. So um, we're involved with everything, you know, in my job with them too, they're going to be like, well, we're going to put a, a vault toilet here or campsite there. And, you know, and part of my job is to make sure our cultural interests um, are not hurt in any way, you know, whether re natural resources mm -hmm. or, or whatever, you know, so, um, and again, it's federal money. I get involved. So I don't know how many projects I review <laughs> um, a year. Uh, any, anything like that involves federal money. Someone putting it in a dock, again, down in Bar Harbor to major bridge projects, cell phone towers, um, anything that involves federal money. Mostly I deal with D main DOT, Federal Highway, Army Corps of Engineers um, are the bulk of it. But you know, again, I have other projects with Department of Energy, um, with wind turbines, solar, um, Department of Defense I work with, with our bases here in Maine. Um, so anything like that, anything that involves, if it's gonna break the earth and it has federal funds, that project comes across the TIPO's desk. So, wow. yes. Oh. Um, I'll come back. Go ahead. When was between the Pentagon and Sebastopol, and I've heard that there is some red, there was some red paint people on Sebastopol. Does that make any sense to you? And it's where the 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 dam is now, where they have fish ladders. Okay. Yeah. The question was: uh, Is there red paint in the Kennebec watershed? I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, there are certain sites and where you're talking about more than likely. I mean, if it's known that there is, then yeah, I would say yes. And I have a picture to show you while we're sure. at it. Sure. Uh, down on our family blueberry, or near our family blueberry lands. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Someone painted a face, a serpent face on a giant rock. That's, that's really cool. <clears throat> yes. I have a question. Uh, <laughs> agriculture. How far north in Maine do you think they were able to grow corn? I, I, I have a reason for asking that. <laughs> uh, growing corn in Maine, how far north? That I don't know. Um, I'm sure the soil changes some in some capacity. Um, I mean, like you said, you know, going the further north you get, the more potatoes. Yeah. alfalfa you know all different other stuff that i don't know how the extent Yeah, and again, it could be soil. You know, or is the soil better down this way? Um, I'm not too too sure on that, but I mean, that's a good question. Yeah. Yes. Um, you have made my day. Oh, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the uh, the team that worked on the foundation document for the National Park Service for the National for Potomac Woods and Waters, and I don't even remember what year, but that's been a while now and at the time we were there wasn't a lot of information that we were able to get our hands on mm -hmm. and um i um you know i just kind of wondered how valuable that national uh, monument was to the natives from a resource standpoint and to hear you say what you said about it tonight just I just feel what <laughs> really, really happy. I do want to ask you though: Is it relative to other sites, say around the state of Maine? I mean, how would you rank what you're finding there? I mean, is it is it at the top near the top of the list? At the top of the list? Uh, I'm just kind of curious. So maybe you don't want to <laughs> for lots of cool reasons. Maybe, but it's a very high quality site. I take it for. Some are, yeah. The question was, the archaeological sites are they better, right? Are they better, well, or, or ranking archaeological sites I've worked on? No, the Cotton was one. Yeah, yeah, within the monument, within the Cotton. Oh. I don't really rank sites all that well. I mean, some sites really step stand out. Yeah. Um, 
the sites we're working on up there have already been looked at in the past. And when we do find new sites, it is exciting. Yeah. Um, finding new new sites that, you know, that, that had never just been overlooked. Um, and some of the materials that come out of there, you know, is it's very exciting. You know, I mean, it's, we're getting um, like two of my favorite stones are being found, you know, the Mensungan chert and the Kineo rhyolite. Um, but they're far few in between right now. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of sites, you know, excuse me, along the, you know, along the East Branch corridor. Um, not so much when you get up into the hills and mountains. Um, but again, we haven't looked there yet. We're still like trying to get through the river corridor first. Um, and then we'll satellite out. Well, hopefully, hopefully the zoning works to protect what you were uh, it does. Zoning does. Yeah. Well, it's. Yeah. There's a. Yeah. You really. Park Service really can't do anything up in there without working with the tribes to begin with. Um, but they want to keep it as rustic as possible, which is great. I mean, they're putting in the visitor contact station now up on Lookout Mountain, which is a huge project. Um, but other than that, they're just, you know, you get a vault toilet here, vault toilet there, mm -hmm. you know, at, at the campsites, but they're keeping them as rustic as possible. Um, some of the existing campsites have like a lean one lean to um, some, you can't even have a fire. So you got to <laughs> figure out that situation and how you know, you're going to be eating, you know, differently when you're out there. Um, but again, the, yeah, the, the campsites are really, I mean, they're, you're lucky if you got a picnic table on some of these sites. So, and that's kind of cool too. So, you know, people want that experience. That's why I said, it's not like Acadia. Acadia, you're gonna go feast on lobster and drive a beautiful road. Up there, you're in the back country and be prepared for it. Yeah. A couple of Zoom questions. Sure. So, um... One question was, is more legislation needed to ensure that repatriation or rematriation of sacred remains to ensure that that happens? I guess. Is there more legislation? Okay. Uh, more legislation working with NAGPRA, with repatriation. Um, currently, yes. <laughs> um, they're, we're in the middle of reviewing um, new regulations that they're instilling into the existing document because it's a law now it's already you know a federal law so but now they're really kind of picking it apart and changing the rules and regs which gotta, we got to keep updated on too um i don't know right now it looks like it's for the better but you know when you read in between the lines when you know really get into the meat of the of the document it's like whoa no 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 can't do that you know, and so we have tribes, not just here in Maine, but across the country have say on what what that is, but we don't have the final say. We can only, you know, coerce, <laughs> say, you know, maybe if you just tweak it this way, you know, and if we get lucky, they will. But um, we're right now we are reviewing new uh, rules and regulations that are being uh, rewritten into the document itself. <clears throat> And then another person asked, um, how do contemporary Penobscot people relate to this information about their heritage? What's that again? <laughs> so, how do contemporary Penobscot people relate to this information about their heritage? Okay. Contemporary Penobscots with learning like learning learning archaeology and um our community is very interested i believe and you know you know we're deeply rooted in our traditions and for me when again when we have stuff brought back when we repatriate stuff there's coming home for a reason you know it's something that we may have forgotten you know over time you know i don't know how many people well, remember, I'm just going to go make a gouge, you know what I mean? So you look at the items that are that are in museums. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think we're all generally interested in archaeology. You know, we want to see what our ancestors made. For me, as an undergrad, I was into the faunal materials. I wanted to know what our ancestors ate. 
you know, so um, that was really, really important to me as well. And it's pretty much the same diet we eat now. I mean, it's moose season, so um, we ate moose back then and everyone's eating moose right now. So good, that's a good question. Some strange person named Jill Tuck Alexis uh, <laughs> says, how about a song, Chris? Shortly. <laughs> a song shortly to that anonymous person who asked for a song. Well, Chris, can I ask one question? Sure. Um, how was it that you actually managed to convince Harvard that you were, a, a, you know, a legitimate receiver? Yeah. Okay, changing Harvard's mind with repatriation. Um, new leadership at Harvard oh. uh, played a big part of it. Um, new directors, you know, new program managers. Um, and I think just them, they put out a proclamation in 2020, early, like in January of 2020, saying we're re-examining our collections and we're putting this notice out there to all tribal nations. Mm -hmm. um, we're sending you a catalog of what we have from your region. Mm -hmm. And finally, we just put it in again after putting in and putting in you know, for 30 something years, getting denied, um, we get a lawyer. <laughs> so lawyering up helped yeah <laughs> to put it bluntly yeah yes i was wondering about uh you use the word village a number of times and uh and uh, in, my, in my own discussions with uh native uh there's it, always there's always this issue about the use of words and the word village is kind of a european word mm. And, and in terms of, and it evokes in most people a, a scene of some kind of bucolic nature or whatever, people living there. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, I get the, my, my sense is that it may not really apply to the kinds of habitations because they're more seasonal, perhaps, or they were, and you know, people don't, people don't know, don't normally think of villages being seasonal. And so, right. I wonder what, what sort of lexicon does anybody use, you know, or, or what, how, how do we describe, how do we, how do we work around this issue of language and lexicon, and what we, how we, how we try to make, make a, a broader understanding of, of how Native peoples live? Yeah, so, I'm going to rephrase that one. Um, so looking at villages, using like terms like village and settlements and stuff. Um, yes, they were seasonal, definitely. You know, um, like the site I work in in Blue Hill wasn't, a, I mean, it may have been a permanent settlement, but it was definitely a large site, aggregation site in the spring when the fish were running. Because um, the falls at the time were not like they are today. You know, you picture the sea level being five meters lower than it is today, that major falls going from, you know, the Goddard salt pond was probably a freshwater stream that went up into a freshwater pond. Yep. Um, so it definitely was seasonal and like main village sites are definitely, you know, aggregation sites. So like an old town with our main village being there, um, where the Milford Dam is, is a, is a waterfall and we fish there, you know, so again, that's probably another aggregation fishing site um, with family camps, you know, where families went yep. for a large part of the year, you know, like with my family, South Alexis family, our traditional hunting and fishing grounds was the Moosehead Lake region. And then we'd either come down here to Norwich Walk or go down to past, uh, Penobscot River. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So it, again, uh, yeah, the, there's a lot of, and that's being looked at again, you know, I, I see it in some, you know, uh, periodical reviews of, the use of languages, you know, to, it, it really is, you know, and, um, and it's kind of, I don't know, makes, makes me want to think outside the box on that too. Now you mentioned it, you know, but I mean, definitely village sites themselves were more primarily, you know, aggregation sites where the families would go back off to their, their traditional territories. So the, the consideration of what I'm saying is, I don't really know, Consideration of how they describe playing home is entirely different from you know a stick built. Right. Right. 
Yeah, no, I mean, that's uh, brings up a funny story with uh, when Henry David Thoreau was here going through Maine with his Penobscot guy, Joe Polis, you know, after the journey up into Moosehead and down back, they returned to Indian Island and Thoreau looks at him and says, what does it feel like to be home? And Polis says, I've always been home, even when we were, you know, up north, I, I'm, I'm, I was always home. I never left home, you know, even though his house was on Indian Island. <laughs> so, yeah. And again, it's, it, you know, to look at the, the language dynamics on that, I don't know. I, I definitely would have to look more into it and talk to other indigenous scholars. You know, what, 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 what do you think about that? You know, I've never really thought about it so much. Language creates impressions. It does. Yeah, language does create impressions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I keep thinking of uh, who's the Russian woman who's the speech person on their own. So, but uh, she has some uh, really incredible discussions about language and how the implications of various tribal languages around the world, indigenous languages, and and how people other languages, well, I mean, you know, the language focused on different things, different language, and, and how that can, what the implications are, the use of your words and right. You know, yep. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I've never, for all the years, I've never had a question like that. It's, it's really cool. Yes. There's uh, a museum on the Hinkley campus uh, called the L.C. Bates Museum. And I wonder if there are <coughs> items there that should be repatriated. It's a very eclectic collection. Uh, has anyone been there? Yeah. The yeah. Hinkley Museum? Yeah. I'm not sure where that is. That's just down the down Oh, down the oh. oh. It's down there. I don't know. As far as repatriate repatriation, if it's if they have federal funds, if they use federal funds, then they have to. They're required to. But it's if they're not, like you know, towns have historical societies and um, and small collections like that with no federal funding. They they don't have to oh, do anything. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So I mean, out of good faith. Yeah, I mean, some some historical societies out of good faith that I've worked with have returned artifacts, you know, just going in and be like, oh, that's cool. And I tell them, hey, you know, that came from here, and there. you know, and, you know, you get a letter saying, well, we want to return these to you. And we do have a lot of, excuse me, donations come back to the tribes um, just out of good faith, um, which is nice. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, you know, we try to. You know, make make it worth their while. You know, we'll get we'll gift them something. You know, baskets or or something um, for returning items. Especially with they have burial items <laughs> is the main thing. Um, if they just want to return a collection um, that they have, I mean, that's that's great too. You know, um, not all our tribal communities have museums. We're lucky enough to have one, and we're having a new one built um, that's going to meet federal standards with climate control and, and all that, um, with more space. <laughs> um, right now our, our museum's small and we're just kind of just running out of storage basically. Um, so we're looking forward to our new museum being built. Um, you take the from the Kenbeck River Basin? Um, we would, um, and others, you know, I've gotten collections from like mid coast Maine um, which is really, you know, they're like, we don't know what to do with it. We just don't want to just, you know, sell it or, or whatever. It will take it. Yeah. Um, even if they're not great, you know, just a regular collection of arrowheads, um, we'll, we'll take them in as long as we, you know, we'll give them full credit where, who it was that donated, where it came from, um, and stuff like that. But yeah. Yes. So Chris. 5,000 years, a long time. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about your evidence of your collecting stories and the time frame of your research and others. Whether there's some that data you can kind of extrapolate what populations were at various times during the period that you um, outlined for us here. Yeah. Is there is there a sense of sort of population flow, expansions, contractions, and then we run into the brick wall of, of contact of course and things really will have to be changed. Um, is there is there uses of the 
evidence that we're creating that kind of destiny population? Okay, so looking at population sizes via the content that comes out of a site, yeah. it's very hard. <laughs> um, there, there was an old theory out there that they could base a population on how many arrowheads they pulled out of the ground in one site, but you really, you really can't do that. So there's no definitive way to tell a population size by just the artifact count. Um, it's really, really tough, um, especially inland on the coast. You know, with the shell mounds, you really can't either. You know, I mean, those shell mounds accumulated over thousands of years, you know, hundreds of years. Um, you're, yeah, it's just, uh, it's tough. I mean, you can go on some some sites, you know, if it's a large site, how big the population could have been, but there's no definitive answer for that. No. Yes. Um, from the, the shell mounds, um, where they're trying to war against each other, from the, uh, the nature of the um, arrowheads or spears. Mm. Determining if tribes were at war through the archaeological evidence? Opposing groups, perhaps? Again, that's probably hard to determine. I mean, it could have been, you know, when you're finding different styles of stone tools in a, in a shell mound that's not normally there, it could have been traded more than likely, or it could have been evident, you know, it could have been a, a skirmish somewhere else and they brought the tools back. Uh, there's, again, there's no real definitive answer on that, um, on determining if, if that, was an actual like a battle site or, or something like that. Most shell mounds are habitation sites. So, um, and again, the trade was pretty extensive um, up and down. So this was a friendly trade? Yes. More, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I would definitely say yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, does the, you know, we, I'm thinking about the Norshawk site, uh, the settlement site in that area and the fact that they were also growing a lot of corn. Um, and it makes me wonder about the fact that it may have been a more permanent site. I mean, it's not as though people weren't going in to the coast and trading, but someone had to be kind of paying attention to the corn. Right. And um, so has that been, have you guys looked at that area from that point of view? or? Has that been evaluated archaeologically? Yeah, the Norwich Walk site with the intensive agriculture. Yeah. Um, or just it has been. In terms of, um, I'm not too familiar with the agriculture yeah. part of it. I mean, I know the archaeology part of it. Right. Yeah, but as far as the evidence of corn, um, a site like that, I mean, our, our soils are so acidic. Yeah. So any evidence of anything carbon based gets dissolved right, right. you know over time right. so really wouldn't have that oh, direct evidence of settlement though. Has that been on the it has yeah, yeah the state yeah the state has been work, worked on that yeah um, on and, that site itself and across the river mm -hmm. yeah. yep yep and, and and i believe the university as well yeah has worked on that yep yes now we didn't have the boundaries international boundaries in prehistoric times as we have now. Um, do you collaborate with any of the uh, archaeologists in Canada? Um, collaborating with archaeologists in Canada. Um, I reached out to a couple, mostly in New Brunswick. Um, not so much over into Quebec, mainly because I don't speak French. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to find someone in Montreal that speaks English. Um, but we do collaborate with other archaeologists via other tribes. So, you know, if I need to talk to someone in New Brunswick, you know, if I can't reach out to them personally, I'll ask one of my Micmac friends, hey, can you reach out, you know, and send me, give me my contact. Um, but collaborations like that do happen. Um, for me personally, though, I primarily work with the University of Maine system. So I work with UMO, USM. Um, you know, I work with Harvard as well. Um, 
you know, I, luckily I still have a great relationship with them. Um, <laughs> but um, there are collaborations where, we, you know, the historic preservation offices do collaborate with other archeologists. Yeah. And I'd like to get up into Canada a little more. I mean, um, they have some really interesting sites and I'd like to see what source materials from Maine are up in, up in there and talking about that trade route. Yeah. Yes. A quick question. Sure. Um, so the uh, rock along the Kennebec that has the Pepsico on it, mm -hmm. is, is anybody actively trying to preserve that that you're aware of? You are. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, in what way are you doing that? Um, so working with the petroglyph site in the Kennebec, yeah, the family's really adamant about preserving it um, as best they can. Um, I know back in, I'll say late 70s, early 80s, um, the state went in and did their excavations and, and whatnot at the site and um, got silicon molds. But even that was destructive mm -hmm. to the rock itself. Um, other people do rubbings, like, yeah. um, but you're leaving the marks when you rub off the paper onto the rock. I've seen Sharpie marks on the rock where you can tell someone is rubbing and just Sharpie line across the rock. Eventually that'll go away, but still you're doing something to the rock itself. There's new technology out there with, instead of using the old silicon style stuff, it's a new, you just, pour it on and it peels off and it doesn't damage the rock at all. Um, I wanted to do that um, early on, like 2015. I was thinking about trying that with the family, but the family was still distraught about the 70s and 80s. Uh, you know, they were like, no, we don't want no more, nothing more happening to this, you know, to our property. For one, it's their property. So they had every right to say no. Um, and I, took it to heart, you know, and we've known the family for a very long time who owns that land. Um, for me, I'd take a million pictures, you know, um, yeah. is the best way to do it. I mean, that's the only mitigation that we can do. I mean, just like any historic structure, like when they tore down the old Old Town Canoe Factory, the only thing they could do was take pictures, <laughs> you know, to, to salvage it. It was that, but with, with the rock itself, pictures, you know, um, replicas, you know, I mean, I actually did replicate two images from the rock onto my dad's, I hand packed them um, onto my dad's gravestone. So I did the moose hunt and the mother earth symbol on his, on his grave, I had a big chunk of slate and I packed it in, you know, so just replicating them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that river, that section of the river, a lot more used today than it did 20 years ago. It is. A lot more. It is. And yeah. And what's sad for me is when I go there to visit the site, I'm always picking up trash. People are leaving trash. They're coming in by canoe, you know, or kayak. You know, the campsite across the way advertises go see Indian Rock, rent one of our canoes, though, you know, and people are getting up on the rock and getting up on the land. One, they're trespassing. It's private property. It's marked private property, but there's still, every, you know, the last time I went down there, I was picking up cans and bottles and chip crappers. And, um, but as far as preserving them, you know, there's not much you can do, you know, other than let nature just do its thing. I mean, it's, we thought about that as well in Machias Bay with the Petroglyphs. They're underwater at high tide. You know, and that just that sea, the acidity in the sea is deteriorating the bedrock itself. So some of these images don't have full petri. You see like a half a petroglyph and all of a sudden it's just ripped out. So there's not much, you know, just take take a million pictures when you visit a site like that. And um, it's the best thing you can do. You know, other than that, nature's going to take over. You can't haul it off somehow. <laughs> no. No. Anyway, <laughs> It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I do. No, really, we usually do groups, but we don't do this. Yeah.
However many. Oh, no, with the cultural tools. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do not, but I do have um, I'll do a couple of songs. Uh, but we can do that now. Yeah. Right, we're getting on it. Okay. Do you want to arrange this around? So Chris is going to play some music for us. He's going to sing. And we're going to try to set this up so you guys can still see him. Splashes are coming out. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to. You there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so we'll close it out tonight. Um, I'll sing a song or two to close it out. Um, I'll try to pick a nice jamma or two. Um, so me and my brothers have a drum group. We are known as the Res Dogs. Um, we don't powwow as much as we used to, but we still like to get together and have fun. Um, so this is a couple of the styles of songs that we sing. <clears throat> Hey, 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 hey,
Thank you. Thank y'all for coming out. Thank you online.